morning, church. How are we all doing? Yes, please take a seat, take a seat. Thank you for the honor. <laughs> it is my privilege this morning to do week three uh, of This Is Us. And I think values, vision, and culture is absolutely something that we ought to be talking about at church. Uh, I think that knowing our direction and knowing how we're going to get there is vital for every single one of us, no matter where we're at in our journey. Perhaps we're first timers or checking out whether, you know, Civic might be home for us. It will help you. These kinds of series will help you uh, decide whether what we're about is what you're about. Uh, or perhaps you've been coming along to Civic for five, 25, 55 years or plus. Hello, Chapel. Uh, it, it also reminds us uh, how we're going with this culture and this vision and these values and perhaps gives God opportunity to gently challenge us to work out how do we better align with our culture and our values. So no matter where you find yourself this morning, we're so grateful that you are here and we're going to jump into it. Week one, we had our amazing, uh, incomparable Pastor Brendan uh, bring our vision for the year or our direction for the year, which was, everyone say, intentionally connected. Not a lot of people said that, Pastor Brennan. They haven't caught up yet. Let's just give them the benefit of the doubt. Intentionally connected. Uh, it was a great message. You can catch up on civic.church. Um, then week two, Pastor Jen uh, gave us three values. Uh, everyone remember those. Genuine, generous, and gracious. Yes, we all talked about it in our connects this week, didn't we? Uh, and it was great. And they all started with G, which helps us remember. And guess what? I get to share three values with you again this morning, all starting with G. Who would have thought? <laughs> I know. Wow. Who are we? <laughs> We're going to jump into it this morning with the first one. We are grateful. Don't forget, you can follow along on the Bible app. All the notes are there, uh, and you can write your own notes as well. It's pretty great to be able to do that. We are grateful. At Civic, we value a spirit of gratitude. This is what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 to 18. Rejoice always and delight in your faith. Be unceasing and persistent in prayer. In every situation, no matter what the circumstances, be thankful, grateful, and continually give thanks to God, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Here at Civic, as dictionary.com says, uh, the definition for grateful, we want to be deeply appreciative of kindness received to us. As a church, we want to be known for our gratitude. People should be interacting with us and getting that sense uh, from us, that, that thank you. They should sense that thank you from their spirits, from our spirits. They should hear it from our mouths and they should read it from our body language and our facial expression. Thank you, Pastor Jenny. You were personally speaking to me last week about being gracious with body language and facial expressions. And I think we can apply it for being grateful as well. We can communicate our gratitude through our body language and our facial expressions. Gratitude never presumes and it never demands. We're just grateful, right? We're grateful when it's great and we're grateful when it's not so great which is the context that Paul was talking about in this chapter. No matter what the circumstances, be grateful and be, keep being grateful because it's the will of God for our lives. That's what he said. It's the will of God for you and for me to be grateful and to keep being grateful. I believe that it's got both supernatural and natural benefits, and we're going to hit a few of them this morning. So I hope you are ready. Are you ready? Yeah, ready. Awesome. Gratitude keeps you in the very center of God's will. Do you want to know uh, how to do God's will for your life? Rejoice in all things, pray in all things, and be grateful in all things. That pretty much wraps it up. In fact, when we're praying, gratitude or thankfulness should be heavily featured. <laughs> we should be always thanking God for who He is, what He's doing, what we have, who we are, where, where we've come from. That spirit of gratitude keeps us in the very center of His will. It also keeps our spirit the captain of our soul. We know this battle, right? I know it, you know it. Our spirit and our soul are always fighting against each other. Our spirit that's been totally redeemed and on fire for Jesus and our soul that's 
well, just not. <laughs> it's not excited, it's not happy, it's not into it at all. And we have this battle, and Paul talks about this battle in Romans 7, and he expresses every single one of our frustration. The things I don't want to do, I do, and the things that I do are the things that I don't want to do, and I'm just tearing my hair out. <laughs> I am so frustrated at myself. Who will save me from this wretchedness, from me, from me just being me? But then in the next breath, he says, but thank you, God. Thank you, God, in Christ, I can do this because you are helping me do this. Through the Holy Spirit, you can help me. And so when we focus on God, when we thank him that he is who he is, that he's done what he's done and he's doing what he's doing, we focus our attention on Jesus. And when we do that, our spirit becomes again the captain of our soul. Our emotions aren't taking the wheel but our spirit then stays the captain of our soul. And that's the, and honestly, I think that's the only way that you can be truly great, grateful is from that spirit place. Sure, our soul can be grateful, but I don't know, there's just a whole nother depth because your soul is not gonna say, thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross. Your soul won't go there, but your spirit will. It keeps your spirit the captain of your soul. The last supernatural benefit is that it keeps you content and humble. I have found in the short years of my life <laughs> so far, the surest way to keep sweet in life, both spiritually and emotionally, is to stay grateful. To stay grateful. I think that the greatest defense against the spirits of envy, egotism, and entitlement is a spirit of gratitude. I'm gonna say that again. Greatest defense against the spirits of envy, egotism and entitlement is a spirit of gratitude. Envy, desiring what somebody else has, gratitude comes against that. Egotism, thinking more highly of yourself, you can combat that with gratitude. Entitlement, feeling like you should have more or you deserve more or better, gratitude can hit that on the head. You know, I was speaking with a lady in our church, a beautiful lady in our church uh, a couple of Sundays ago in the foyer. And I encourage us all to stay around after the service and talk. That's the church being the church and it does my spirit good. Tell you what, I was chatting with her and she was just um, sharing some of the very real concerns that she was facing and she battles a lot of things quite genuinely. But you know, she just looked at me with such genuineness and said, Kerry, my life is not the way that I want it to be but I am so grateful to God for what he's done and I feel very blessed. I mean, that's a mic drop moment. I could just walk off the platform right here. That spirit of gratitude was so uh, evident in her life. And it's not what I want it to be, but it keeps me sweet, this spirit of gratitude. But then in the natural, there's a couple as well. It improves your mood, your mind, and your mental health. A lot of you know that I'm a huge fan of neurologist Dr. Carolyn Leaf, and she talks a lot about the chemical changes that happens in your brain when you both demonstrate and receive gratitude. And she posted recently five scientifically proven benefits uh, of gratitude that, that she has uh, done her own research on and found studies for as well. Here they are, they'll, they'll pop up on the screen. A free antidepressant thanks to the increased levels of dopamine and serotonin. Thanks guys. A natural and free pain reducer, thanks to all of the dopamine going around in your body. It improves sleep quality. Who needs better sleep? Every hand is, should probably be raised. <laughs> By activating the hypothalamus, which controls our sleep. It aids us in stress regulation due to reduced levels of cortisol. And it helps us build and, and uh, improve relationships, helping us win new friends. Scientifically proven, people, the benefits of demonstrating and receiving gratitude. Leads on to the last natural benefit, which is gratitude breeds gratitude. You know, I found the more um, that I am grateful, the more that I find myself surrounded by grateful people. Because people wanna be around grateful people, right? You know it, I know it. Um, when you're around people that are just grateful for life, then I don't know, it just does something inside of you. You just want to be around more people like that. Pastor Brennan said at week one, you show me your friends and I'll show you your future. If you wanna have a grateful future, if you wanna be grateful in the future, be grateful yourself, but surround yourself with grateful people. 
We want to excel in gratitude here in this community because it is a deep value for us. But I know, I know it's not easy sometimes. We all face real difficult challenges and honest challenges. Days where you just feel it is so hard to find something to be grateful for. It is so hard. Even though we know we live in Australia for number one, but we've got God, number two, well, that should be number one, really, but um, God's placed us here. But still, there are genuine things that we find challenging to face. But Paul was exactly the same, you know? Uh, he wrote this chapter, or he wrote this section uh, after being in the persecuted church for 10 plus years. By this time, he had been thrown into prison uh, and re rescued from prison. He had been uh, thrown out of cities. He had seen miracles and healings. He'd also had his life threatened. He'd also been stoned almost half to death once. And yet he was able to pen these words, be grateful and keep being grateful. Because gratitude, a spirit of gratitude is not a spirit of denial or ignorance. Hear me, church. It's not, we're just gonna be grateful and just cover it all and just not face our um, reality. We have to face the brutal facts of our reality with a spirit of gratitude. Going, God, what I'm going through is real, but there are things to be grateful for. It's a lifestyle. And I think the only way that we do that is by practice, by helping, by asking Holy Spirit to help us to constantly be grateful. I'm gonna hit you with a few things uh, as we go through each of these values, just three ways that we can maybe outwork these values each week. So here are the ones for being grateful. Express your gratitude to God somehow this week. That'll look different to every single one of us, whatever that might be. Uh, I actually had um, a pastor many, many years ago uh, say that he was having this moment of being grateful and uh, he stopped at the servo to get some fuel uh, and uh, he was just so overwhelmed with gratitude to God that he bought himself a Snickers and bought Jesus one too. And uh, he went to the car and put it on the, put it on the driver's, on the um, passenger seat and said, Jesus, that's for you because I'm just so grateful. So whatever it is for you this week, express your gratitude to God. Maybe show someone else in your world how grateful you are to them. This can go in so many different ways, writing them a card, sending them a text, um, having a meaningful uh, compliment to them, giving them a hug, giving them a gift. And then the third one, face your brutal reality with a grateful heart for what God is doing in the mess. Remember we were talking, we were singing about it this morning Be because God, even though I don't see it and I don't feel it, I know that you're still working. So that's gratitude. We are grateful. We're also generational. Here at Civic, we value a generational mindset. Now, I wanna confirm, I suppose, the definition of generation, what we're talking about when we say generational. We're very familiar, I'm sure, with the way that our society has defined generations, uh, and generational ana analysis has become huge in the last few decades. And it works out, or it helps us work out how to engage, uh, communicate, connect, and grow people and organizations. But just for a bit of fun this morning, I wanna see who's in the room. We're going to throw up on the screens uh, the breakdown of the commonly referred to generations. And when I come across yours, why don't you raise your hand or if you get, you know, a bit excited, you can give me a shout. Uh, those uh, online, you can give us a thumbs up in the comments or chapel. We might be able to hear you from here. Um, so give us a yell as well. Just to know who generationally we have in the room. Do we have any builders born before 1946 in the room? Yes, we got a couple of hands there. Very good. Oh, we are so grateful for you guys because you built most of our suburbs, institutions, and infrastructures that we enjoy today. So let's just give them a round of applause, church. <laughs> We're grateful. We are grateful. What about our baby boomers born between 1946 and 1964? Woo! Yes. <laughs> I knew I'd have to. <laughs> that's, that's very, oh, one, one, oh, two. Two, 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 two. Yeah, very good. And I had a couple more over. Yeah, very, very good. Thank you. Uh, you guys, um, births boomed after World War II and so did economy, housing, construction and infrastructure and pretty much all of Australia just boomed after the war. So you were a part of that. Gen Xers born between 1965 and 1979. 
Yeah, that was, that was uh, yeah, very good. I like it. We've got a fair, a fair uh, representation of you guys here today too. A generation wanting to push back on anti-establishment and authority figures. Does that sound about right? <laughs> no one's putting their hand up now. Uh, Gen Ys, that's me. Also millennials, woo, woo, born between 1980 and 1994. Who else was in the room with me? Yes, Qu quite a good uh, representation. We are best known for smashed avo, specialty coffee, and traveling abroad. I mean, I would have liked us to be known for something a bit more meaningful, but I can't argue with that. <laughs> Gen Z's or Z's, born between 95 and 2009. Yes, excited from the front row. We've got a few over there. Very cool. Conservative and resilient. Keen to learn and make a difference with their life. What do you reckon, Sam? He's <laughs> just laughing. <laughs> this is from McCrindle Research, people. They don't get it wrong, I promise. And then we've got our Gen Alphas, born between 2010 and 2024. Obviously, the current um, generation. Uh, we might have a few here, and of course, up at Boost and Civic Kids as well. They're the first generation to be born solely in the 21st century, uh, shaped by technology, globalization, and of course, our lovely friend, COVID. So we've got a quite good, um, you know, widespread representation of the generations here this morning. And I think that's great in, in a healthy church life. We need that well-roundedness. But we're not just multi-generational here at Civic. We, we don't just exist with many different generations. We're generational. So we honor everything that we, that we know and we learn about the different generations, but we hold to a deeper understanding of what generational really means according to the scriptures here at Civic. Socially, we belong to different generations based on our set birth year. Scripturally, we belong to the same generation based on our shared years. So Paul talks about King David in Acts, and this is what he says. He said, now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep, a.k.a. he died. But he wasn't just speaking of David's friends, his cohort, the people that he grew up with. He was speaking about all those that lived at the time of David, the whole multitude of human beings alive on the planet, living and breathing at that time. So when we look at generational thinking from God's perspective, it's totally inclusive. It's all inclusive. Everyone alive at this time is in this generation. We belong together to this generation. So we need to take all the good stuff that we learn from the generation definitions and, and layer it on top of this scriptural understanding that we are all in this together. We're on planet Earth together for something together uh, to this appointed time to serve God in this one generation. Chronological age doesn't matter. Christian age doesn't even matter. Everyone has something to contribute and something to learn, and we need each other now. When we have that perspective, when we know that we're all in this together, then we value the people, we value their perspective, and we value their part. So we value them as individuals, uh, the ones that God has called in. We value their perspective, their unique view on life. How do they see things? How do they approach things? And we value their part. What's their unique skill set and gift set that they get to contribute to the table? Paul says it like this in Ephesians 4, instead speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every aspect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We all have a part to play in this body and we all value every single part that is played in this body. So let's be known as a community of believers uh, who value people, value their perspective, and value their part. Here are three ways that we can outwork being generational this week. We could even start today. Have a meaningful conversation with someone from a different generation. As you saw, we've got so many in the room today. In the foyer, after the service, approach somebody that might be older or younger and start a meaningful conversation with them. Why don't you ask God to help you with any prejudice that you might have against another generation or somebody older or younger than you? Or how about you find your part in the body and you play it? Because we belong to this one generation here for a purpose in God, and we need you. We need every single one. So that's being generational. And our last G, I hope you're all still with me, we are gentle. 
At Civic, we value this spirit of gentleness. In fact, it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit as found in Galatians 5. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's best defined or described as meekness, which is a gentle strength. And in the scriptures, it's usually in the context of how we handle injuries or offenses to us. So not just in our everyday lives, but but especially how we handle um, attacks or uh, things that are um, coming against us. Meekness or gentleness is the right blend of force and reserve. It's this perfect in-between. I love this. This is one of, one, uh, from one of the commentaries that I was reading. It's a willingness to not easily be provoked and an unwillingness to provoke. So you're not interested in poking and prodding people, but at the same time, uh, you're not um, in a position where you're going to be poked and prodded yourself. <laughs> you're not going to rise up because <laughs> your heart isn't to stir things up or to be stirred up but it's to settle things down, gently, gently, softly, softly. But it doesn't look like weakness. We can't get it confused with weakness. Meekness is not weakness. There is a strength there. It's present. It's just not prominent or pushy. Pastor Brennan describes it like an iron fist in a velvet glove. I didn't have velvet gloves to give you an illustration this morning, but I do have an iron fist, sadly. (laughs) Iron fist, Velvet glove, I love that because, you know, it is firm, but you're not going to feel that harshness. All you're going to feel is the soft touch of the velvet glove. It's a great analogy. And Paul encourages us to make it a lifestyle. Colossians 3, be merciful as you endeavor to understand others and be compassionate, showing kindness toward all. Be gentle and humble, unoffendable in your patience with others. Unoffendable. We're not going to get offended nor are we going to intentionally cause offense. That's not our heart. Remember, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Again, in Ephesians 4, with tender humility and quiet patience, always demonstrate gentleness and generous love toward one another, especially toward those who may try your patience. Paul, why did you have to put that in there? (laughs) That just made it harder, (laughs) especially to those who might try your patience. Uh, In Connects this week, uh, we were talking about the three Gs, um, uh, our values, and uh, we were talking with uh, the women. I threw the question out, which of these uh, values, genuine, generous, and great, gracious would be a strength for you and which one would be a growth area for you. And we had a great chat uh, and it's likely that we'll revisit um, that chat for the next Connect. So spoiler spoiler alert, ladies, I'm going to put my hand up um, that gentleness is a growth area for me. (laughs) I am not so good at this because I know myself, uh, I can get Um, in myself, I get defensive um, easily or more easy than I'd like, easier than I'd like. Um, I, uh, I, yeah, I I get defensive. Uh, I have lost my point uh, (laughs) because I'm just thinking about me. Um, I run out of patience quicker than I'd like and I definitely come in with an iron fist without even worrying about the glove. Like what glove? Who needs the glove? Where's the glove? Just leave the glove alone. Uh, I am constantly challenged, though, in a very good way, in the very best way, by those around me on team, in my friendships, who demonstrate this so well and so consistently. Pastor Brennan and Margaret, you guys are absolutely up the top of that list. Uh, I have watched you guys over years and years consistently do this, uh, and it's a good challenge, so thank you for challenging me. (laughs) We want to grow in this, right, as a church. This is a key value for us. We want to do do this. We want to work gently with people, with organizations, with other churches. Uh, When we're in conflict, when we've got tragedies, uh, when we're working through grievances and accusations and injustices, we want to be gentle. Whatever season we're in, we want to come from that spirit of gentleness. How do we do that? There's a couple of things this week that aren't so easy, but I'm going to throw them out anyway. Pause when you get fired up. And consider a softer approach. (laughs) That's for somebody today, could just be me. Let go of an offense or that desire for retaliation for a past hurt. 
Just let it go. How about try to understand before feeling the need to be understood? That's a big part of being gentle. I'm going to try empathy. I'm going to practice empathy and try and understand where you're coming from so I'm not rising up and, and battling you. Be gentle. So we're grateful, we're generational, and we're gentle. And of course, Jesus is our example for each of these values. He was grateful. He thanked the Father on so many occasions. He was generational. He spoke with the elders when he was a child at the temple. He let the children come to him when he was in ministry. And some of his team were half of his age when he was in ministry. And he was gentle. Look at the way that he interacted with people. Look at the way that he handled the cross, the epitome of meekness. So he is our example and the Holy Spirit is our teacher. So if you are struggling with any of these values or you wanna align more and more to any of these values, to all of these values, ask Holy Spirit. He will guide you, he will help you, he will do it gently because that's how he does it. (laughs) And when we intentionally connect to Jesus, which we're all trying to do better and better this year, when we intentionally connect to Jesus, we just find ourselves becoming more grateful and more generational and more gentle because it's who he is and it rubs off on who we are, which then impacts how we intentionally uh, connect with our church, with each other and our friendships and with the world, which is our whole vision and, and thought for the year. So I hope you've enjoyed hearing a little bit more about our heart. Why don't you stand with us this morning and we're gonna just pray that we don't just hear these words and we don't just talk about this, but we actually take away something from Holy Spirit for us to learn and to lean into. Father, we are grateful. We're grateful today, God, that you speak to us. Lord, thank you for these values that you have given us as a church and help us all individually, God, no matter where we're at in the journey. Help us align to these values because we know they're from heaven. We know that Jesus, you demonstrate and you exemplify these. And we pray, God, that you just continue to align our hearts to these values. God, give us opportunity this week to outwork and to demonstrate being grateful, whatever that looks like in our spheres and in our spaces. Lord, to be generational, not to just think of age as a barrier, but to understand we're part of the one shared generation here to do something amazing for you. God, and help us be gentle, especially when we're in those times where we wanna react and we wanna rise up. But God, help us, help us be uh, approach things with a gentle spirit the way that you do. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you do help us. Oh, we're so grateful for that. And we give you all the praise, God, and all the honour, because you absolutely deserve it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Take the opportunity, church, in the foyer after the service to chat to people, shout somebody a coffee, and let's continue being the church, hey? And we're going to wrap up next week with week four uh, of this series uh, with Pastor Jared, and it's going to be great. But for now, I'm going to hand it over to the team. Thanks, guys.